This is the final video in the Approaches Unit, and I hope you've been paying attention as we've covered each section, because now we're going to take what we know about each approach so we compare each one to all the others. This could get confusing, with there being so many potential differences between each approach. So in this video, I'm gonna try and make it simple. We're gonna focus on only a few key ideas and see how each approach relates to that concept. That should prepare as well for any comparison question we're likely to need to answer. The Psychboost app now has three features, flashcards, multiple choice quizzes, and see if you can work out the key term from its definition with the key term tester. Try Paper 1 for free right now. And Patreon supporters can watch Psychboost videos ad-free, learn from over 17 hours of exclusive exam tutorial videos, and access hundreds of digital and printable resources, including mind maps, quiz sheets, worksheets, teaching slides, and more. Comparison of approaches. By the end of this video, you should be able to directly compare any approach you've studied in this unit with any other approach. These are the topics we're going to use to compare each approach. The methodology used, three topics from the issues and debate unit, and how the approach has been applied to psychological treatments. I've made a sheet you can use to note down each comparison I'm going to cover in this video. Print it out and fill it out as we go. If you need to write a comparison essay, I'll give you some important advice. What you need to do is compare the approach on each issue separately. Some students are tempted to write everything they know about one approach, then say, on the other hand, and then write everything they know about the other approach. This isn't a direct comparison. We need to say on the issue of, pick an issue, approach A is, explain that, whereas approach B is like, and explain that. Do that a few times and we've effectively compared one approach to another. You'll notice as I explain how each approach is connected to the issue, I try to explain quickly but with enough detail to show I know the principles of that approach. So as an example, I won't just be saying the biological approach is scientific. I'll be given a little more detail by explaining how exactly the biological approach is scientific. For biological psychology, it's the use of objective measuring devices such as fMRIs and genetic tests. Scientific methodology. Behaviorists are seen as highly scientific, only researching directly observable stimuli response mechanisms. Their research studies, including Pavlov's research on dogs, and Skinner's research on rats also uses large samples, standardized procedures, and highly controlled conditions. This focus on the scientific method has allowed other researchers to exactly replicate their findings on conditioning. Social learning theorists use experimental techniques with large sample sizes and laboratory conditions to investigate concepts such as modeling and vicarious reinforcement. However, social learning theorists study mediational processes. As these are internal mental processes, they can't be directly observed and must be inferred from behavior. These inferences could be mistaken, reducing the scientific credibility of the approach. Cognitive psychologists attempt to validate their theoretical models, such as the working model of memory, by using highly controlled laboratory experiments. However, as the models represent internal mental processes that can't be directly observed, only inferred from behavior, cognitive psychology is not considered fully scientific. Biological psychologists study directly observable physical processes, such as brain activity. They also use objective measuring devices such as fMRI scanners, DNA sequences, and blood tests to measure hormone levels. Large-scale placebo-controlled trials are used to test drugs that alter brain chemistry. This focus on objective measurement means biological psychology is seen as highly scientific. Psychodynamic ideas are based on client case studies conducted by Sigmund Freud. Clients would use introspection to report on their internal state of mind. These self-reports would be interpreted by Freud, who went on to develop ideas including the superego. The use of case study is not seen as scientific due to the potential for bias in the researcher's interpretation, and psychodynamic concepts like the superego are not operationally defined, meaning they cannot be scientifically studied. Humanists reject the scientific method completely, arguing that human behavior is too complex to be reduced to simple variables that can be measured scientifically, as well as rejecting the cause and effect principle that scientific research depends on. This means humanistic psychology lacks empirical evidence to support its claims. Determinism. Behaviorists are hard environmental determinists. They consider behavior to be the result of experiences, interactions creatures have with their environment. Behavior an individual has found rewarding in the past will be more likely to repeat it. As there is no role for free will in behaviorist theory, they are seen as hard determinists, assuming behavior is fully caused by the environment. Social learning theorists are environmentally deterministic. Bandora also argued for reciprocal determinism. Not only is our behavior caused by the environment, the environment is determined by our behavior. For example, a child who works hard for a test has an effect on the environment, an A, and the teacher who gives praise. This environment then acts as motivation to work even harder. Cognitive psychologists are soft determinists. 
They agree that there are a range of causal factors that influence behavior. For example, people learn schema through experience. And these act as automatic templates we use to perceive the world and decide how to behave. But cognitive psychologists argue that with conscious effort, maladaptive internal mental processes can be modified. This cognitive restructuring is a principle of cognitive behavioral therapy. Biological determinism is the idea that our behaviors are caused by our physical nature. This includes hormones, brains, neurotransmitters, and genes. Behaviors such as aggression and mental health disorders like OCD can be explained by an imbalance of neurotransmitters, which are due to an inheritance of a dysfunctional gene. As there's no role for free will in biological theory, they're seen as hard determinists. Psychodynamic researchers believe in psychic determinism. This is the idea that our unconscious behaviors are shaped by unconscious thoughts, drives, and repressed memories. These unconscious forces are shaped in childhood and go on to influence adult behavior throughout life. Humanists are the only approach that argue for free will. The idea that humans have agency, we are able to make our own decisions, free from restraints, and we have moral responsibility for those choices. The nature nurture debate. Behaviorists are at the most extreme end of the debate, arguing the most important influences on behavior are environmental factors. These are the stimuli that are in a creature's environment and the reinforcing or punishing environmental consequences of their actions. Experiences that are rewarding are the cause of behaviors being repeated. But even with this approach, there is some role for nature. For example, neutral responses are innate reflex actions. For example, a dog does not have to be trained to drool to food. Social learner theorists explain behavior through nurture, both the direct stimulus response mechanisms of behaviorists, but also social experiences, such as observing models and vicarious reinforcement. Cognitive psychologists argue both aspects are important, as internal mental processes run on the physical biological hardware of the brain. However, the cognitive approach can be argued to be closer to the nurture argument, as their explanations of mental processes such as schemas are formed through experiences in the world. Biological psychologists are at the nature extreme end of the debate, arguing the most important influences on behavior are hereditary. These explain behavior as due to the inheritance of DNA. This codes for biological processes such as neurotransmitter transport in the brain. Imbalances in the system leads to behavior such as increased aggression or mental health conditions. Psychodynamics includes both nature and nurture within its theories. For example, the psychosexual stages are a biological process that all children will experience. However, the experiences the children have while passing through these stages shape the personality they'll have as adults. Humanists are holist. This means they argue any valid explanation of behavior has to include a wide range of factors. These include the influence of genes, so nature, but also nurture, including all environmental factors from direct experiences to wider culture. Reductionism. Behaviorists are highly reductive. They explain behavior, even complex behavior, as due to a chain of simple stimulus response links. Social learner theorists, while agreeing behavior is due to stimulus response mechanisms, are less reductionist than behaviorists as they include the role of internal mental processes. For example, the mediational processes of attention, retention, reproduction, and motivation. Cognitive psychologists' computer analogy explains the mind and brain as similar to the CPU and software. This is argued to be machine reductionist, an over-simplistic view that ignores the important and complex role of emotions and irrationality in humans, as well as ignoring important differences such as computer memory is flawless. However, human memory is reconstructive and often contains errors. Biological psychology is highly reductionist. These psychologists explain behaviors such as aggression, attachment, and mental health conditions like schizophrenia as the result of chemical processes happening within the brain. This oversimplifies the complex and highly personal experience of having an emotion and ignores the role of cognitive and cultural forces. Psychodynamics is not reductionist, as its explanation for behavior includes a range of factors, such as the biological changes that happen in childhood, in addition to experiences that shape an unconscious mind, and how the unconscious mind interacts with the conscious mind. Humanists argue against any reductionist explanation of behavior. They claim the only valid explanation is holistic. This means if an individual experience is to be explained, the widest range of factors need to be included from biological factors and direct experience to education, social learning, and culture. Psychological treatments. Behaviorist principles are used in the treatment of phobias. Flooding and systematic desensitization are therapies that use exposure to the phobic object in an attempt to counter condition phobias, ultimately replacing a fear association with calm. Social learning therapy uses modeling in a safe environment to alter maladaptive behavior. Meaningful role models display appropriate behavior. For example, in treating a child with high levels of aggression, a therapist might show a video of similarly aged children interacting pro-socially and being rewarded for their good behavior. 
Cognitive principles have been used to develop cognitive behavioral therapy. CBT is designed to cognitively structure irrational thoughts such as negative schemas about the self, the world, and the future. Strategies include reality testing irrational thoughts by acting as a scientist, and the therapist disputing irrational thoughts either empirically or logically. Biological theories have led to treatments that influence biological processes, such as brain surgery and drug therapy. Drug therapies for mental health conditions often work by altering the activity of neurotransmitters. For example, SSRIs work by slowing the reuptake of serotonin into the synaptic terminal. Psychodynamic ideas form the basis of psychotherapy. This is a talking therapy that uses introspection to focus on past experiences. Therapists then use these discussions to explore ways in which the unconscious thoughts and feelings might be negatively impacting current behaviour and relationships. Humanistic ideas have been used to develop client-centred therapy, which focuses not on mental illness, but the client's capacity for growth. The therapist's role is not to direct the client, but to assist the client in understanding their own experience and producing their own solutions. The therapist also provides unconditional positive regard. This is respect and accepting the client for who they are. I want to thank everyone over on Patreon for supporting the channel. Because of you, I've been able to teach part-time, meaning I can make Psych Boost on YouTube for everyone. And a special thank you to Azzy Taylor for supporting at the developer level. I do have extra resources that are exclusive to my patrons. So if you decide to sign up, you can grab those over my website. And these include over 100 exam question tutorial videos. Of course, including questions on the approaches unit. I hope this was helpful and I'll see you in the next Psych Boost video.